Hi, I'm Dr. King Owen. In this lecture, we'll be looking at the New Deal. Lecture 24 will examine how Franklin D. Roosevelt and the New Dealers reshaped American politics as they tried to grapple with the effects of the Great Depression. In part one, I'll introduce you to the concept of the New Deal and explain how it got started. FDR wasted no time at the beginning of his presidency to address the problems that Americans were facing. Within the first 100 days of his presidency, Roosevelt persuaded Congress to pass 15 laws in response to the Depression. This shows that he was eager and willing to tackle the economic crisis. He wanted to show Americans that he was getting the job done. He took to the radio to explain his ideas. That medium of communication popular in the 20s now became his chief means of telling Americans what he was doing, why he was doing it, and in the most plain language possible, what his intentions and his purposes were in the first 100 days. These fireside chats were very reassuring to Americans, whom Roosevelt told, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Roosevelt did not do all of this alone. He was a progressive. He had begun his political journey as a progressive, and like progressives before him, he relied on expertise and scientific management of human uh, problems in order to address the difficulties of the Great Depression. We have called these advisors his brain trust. You will see them referred to in images, often wearing glasses. This gives them their nerdy bona fides as the brain trust, but also a graduation cap, uh, which the formal name for is a mortar board. Here's a sampling of legislation enacted in the first 100 days just to show you uh, what is happening in terms of Roosevelt addressing the problems that Americans are facing. So you can see there's laws about banking, um, laws about balancing the budget, uh, Roosevelt repeals prohibition, um, and eventually, of course, we'll get an amendment to undo um, the amendment that was added um, in the World War I era. There is a uh, bit of attention to agriculture. You can see farm, agriculture. Um, there's attention to uh, money and the gold repeal joint resolution. Home mortgages being refinanced to save people from losing their houses. Banking, another farm act, uh, railroad legislation. All of this labor is to show that the president is serious about tackling the problems that Americans face. Here Roosevelt is uh, speaking to the public uh, to um, indicate just how much he wanted them to understand what he was doing and, you know, in plain language, explain to them what caused the depression and why his efforts were going to address it. Roosevelt has come in for a fair amount of criticism in his presidency for the sheer staggering um, volume of legislation that the New Deal comprised. And this cartoonist took a point that um, FDR wanted to make, that this New Deal was not a revolution. This was not a fundamental overthrowing of the American way of life. It's an evolution starting with the brain trust and moving forward to all of the New Deal laws that we will see. And in a way, this is correct. Progressive ideas are not new. And Roosevelt is simply enacting many of the things that progressives would have favored between 1901 and 1920. 
So we can almost think of the New Deal as progressivism 2.0. One of the most important areas that Roosevelt tackled first was finance. Since the stock market had collapsed, since banks had collapsed, it was essential to get Americans to trust the financial system. And in March uh, 1933, there was a bank holiday declared. All banks were closed for four days so that Congress can enact legislation to help banks. And that would make people um, not be able to go to the bank and withdraw money, so banks would be stable for a moment. Uh, the legislation um, required inspection of banks to see which ones were financially sound enough to continue operating and that ones that weren't would be closed. There was an emphasis here in restoring confidence. That is, if people trust the banks, they put their money in the banks, they don't run to the banks and um, clamor for that money to be withdrawn, which in effect shuts the bank down, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Congress also passed the Glass-Steagall Act, 1933, which created insurance systems for banks. FDIC now will be seen on the door of every bank. In fact, don't bank in any place that doesn't have FDIC, because that's pretty sus. Um, the idea for this insurance is that if you um, lose your money because a bank has behaved badly, that the federal government will replace it. You will be insured. And again, that promotes confidence. You trust the system. And when you trust the system, you take actions that get the economy going. In fact, I would say here that one of the things that we often don't understand about the economy is the, the extent to which our belief in its stability, our belief in um, its ability to work for us is a very important factor in whether or not we will take risks. And if we don't take risks, the economy doesn't grow. The Securities Act of 33 and the Securities Exchange Act of 34 were designed to regulate the stock market, designed to regulate banking with the goal of preventing fraud. So once again, if people trust the system, they will invest, they will take risks, they will get involved in the economy and that will slowly get the economy going again. Roosevelt is trying to help those people who were victims of bank failures, where banks had why unwisely invested their customers' money in stocks in order to make a quick buck. Um, and many of these folks, it was not their fault that they lost their money. They stored it in the bank, they expected the bank to have it, and then the bank went bankrupt. It's a newspaper, New York Times showing the four-day bank holiday so everybody's going to take a chill uh four days and let the uh, system be corrected and fixed and sorted out if we trust the system we will invest we will get involved and make you know decisions that um, get the economy going there were many voices on the left that wanted uh, FDR to do more. That is, they thought that even as much as was being done in the early New Deal, more needed to be done. Critics like Huey Long, for example, a very popular politician from the South, called for redistribution of excess wealth to all people um, and created uh, Share Our Wealth clubs uh, to promote his ideas. Uh, Long's push for redistribution sounds pretty Marxist, but it actually comes out of a very Southern populist kind of tradition of, of being critical of the wealthy and the robber barons. Unfortunately for Long, he was assassinated, so his 
threat to FDR's popularity did come to a swift end. Father Charles Coughlin, a Catholic priest, used his radio show to condemn banks and bankers and the financial gurus who had led the United States astray in the Great Depression. So he excoriated, criticized, if you don't know what excoriate means, he criticized um, these bankers for their bad behavior and called for stronger bank reg regulations. And uh, Dr. Francis Townsend called for elderly folks to receive pensions, $200 a month, because he pointed to the fact that many older folks who couldn't work were suffering in the Great Depression. Their families were unable to support them. And why should you suffer merely because you are elderly? The popularity of Huey Long, I think, can be showcased very much in this Share Our Wealth rally where you see Huey Long's image, giant image, um, at this assembly where he would be speaking. This is, um, this has sort of got overtones of almost a totalitarian, um, the, the leader who promises to rescue you from all the horrible things that are happening to you as long as you unquestionably give your loyalty to him. But we'll never know if that would have been the outcome for long since he was assassinated. To talk about the New Deal has often required uh, many textbooks to organize it into three categories. And I want to emphasize that these three categories are not something that FDR came up with. FDR had a habit of inventing solutions almost haphazardly. Someone say, would say to him, we have this problem. He'd say, well, I point you to get on it. Um, even to the point sometimes of having multiple groups address the same problems. So FDR was not a particularly organized um, and disciplined leader in terms of the approach to solving the Great Depression. So in order for you to understand the New Deal without being overwhelmed by it, um, we use three categories to talk about it. And those categories are relief, New Deal acts that provide employment, that is give jobs to people, New Deal acts that encourage industrial or agricultural production. In other words, they're designed to get the economy going, uh, to get the economic engines back up and running. And reform acts, acts that are designed to prevent future depressions by fixing the problems that caused the depression in the first place. Together, these three R's were intended to address the Great Depression, get the economy going, and to solve underlying difficulties that led to the Great Depression occurring in the first place. Keep in mind that these are merely a study device uh, and an organizing device, um, and not necessarily a reflection of FDR's actual um, policies, or at least planned thinking. Other folks um, have created a periodic table of the New Deal. I don't know that this is actually all that useful. It's pretty. Um, it's kind of clever, but at the same time, it doesn't really tell you much. Um, each New Deal act here with the date um, of beginning to the date of the end, um, the leading first persons in charge of these New Deal programs. It looks cool, but you know, the actual periodic table has its own internal logic. You know, going from top to bottom, from left to right means something in the real periodic table. So I don't know that this is anything but just kind of like a gimmicky, cool, pretty thing to look at. I have my own metaphor for the New Deal. 
I think of the Great Depression as an illness, a, a big old sickness that Americans have. And relief programs are very much designed to make you feel better. It's a bowl of hot soup, you know, that helps that runny nose and sore throat. You just feel good and warm on the inside. The recovery programs are like the antibiotics you take to actually get over what is making you sick. And reform is doing what you need to do in order to not get sick again in the future. So eating well and exercising right. So this is my own personal metaphor with my own awesome, great drawings that I did on the whiteboard. Budding artist here. Um, if that helps you, uh, then I'm glad. If not, let's soldier on. In FDR's day, the sheer staggering number of New Deal acts seem to suggest to many Americans the fact that FDR was making things up. You know, Uncle Sam's got quite a bit of medicine over here. You know, he seems to be taking everything and he doesn't seem to be doing any better for it. Um, he kind of has got that glazed, bug-dyed look. Um, FDR is telling Congress, of course, we may have to change results or change remedies if we don't get results. That very much is a progressive idea. You know, we call that pragmatism. That is, we do something to see if it actually gets us what we want uh, in terms of a result. And if it doesn't, we do something else. To other folks, this was not quite all that reassuring. That is, did FDR have a plan? Did he know how to really solve the problems? Or is he just trying a whole bunch of things and hoping something works.